everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Beautifully sunny morning here today. Today on the show, we have Peter Addy, PhD. He's a clinical psychologist and, let's see, licensed professional counselor, licensed mental health counselor out of Vancouver, Washington. Um, great background relative to uh, how we operate on the show here. Um, we'll get more into that um, when we were get to the episode, but he has done some pioneering salvia research and also helped get uh, Yale to do more psychedelic research, started like study groups and reading groups, stuff like that. And uh, it has transformed how Yale approaches psychedelics. So thank you, Peter, for that. <laughs> I'm sure it was a big effort. So yeah, we go all over the map. We talk about salvia quite a bit. We talk about um, psychedelic therapy, transpersonal stuff, and, and quite a bit more. I, I think you'll like this one. So, yeah, stay tuned. Um, I think that's it for the intro. This is a really fun one. Thank you, Peter, for coming on. So if you want to support the show, there's a few ways. So we have a couple sponsors, Audible. Audible is an amazing audiobook service that... Um, you can subscribe to for free with this code I'm going to give you. I use it just about every day. I crank through books on Audible. So at audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today, you can get a 30-day free trial and a free audiobook of your choice. doesn't matter how much it costs. It could be a $90 book and you get it for free. And yeah, just cancel before the 30 days if you don't like Audible. The trial won't kick in and there's no penalty to you. It really supports the show. Uh, again, it's audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today. If that's too hard, psychedelicstoday.com slash welcome, and there's an Audible link right in there. And there's plenty of great psychedelic books from Tim Leary, Terrence McKenna, a uh, recent Mike J book on mescaline, and uh, much more. So check it out, audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today. We are also sponsored by Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com. They've got a really cool set of supplements over there. I really dig it. You get a discount at checkout. I think it's 10% with the code side today. Everything except fitness equipment like weights. So check it out. There's great coffee there, cups. I've got a great Socrates cup I drink out of all the time. And yeah, some of the drinks over there are super good. There's this one chai mix that I loved. It had all sorts of like uh, nutritional mushrooms and, and supplements in it too. So that was cool. They've also got some great multivitamins and, and much more. So check it out on it.com, O-N-N-I-T.com. Use the code PSY today, P-S-Y today to get 10% off your order. If you also want to support the show, you can leave a small monthly donation with our Patreon page and you get early access to content and, and so much more. So that's at patreon.com slash side today. You can help support us for as little as $2 a month. And we love it when people do that. Thank you for all your support so far. We've got plenty of people on there. Just any little bit helps. Also, we've got a really cool course coming up. It is Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists. This is our flagship course to help you as a clinician or a therapist get a handle on this psychedelic topic and how to work in the space. We have a large curriculum that you watch uh, of pre-recorded videos, and then you'll meet up with us eight times on a webinar platform, Zoom, and we support you through your learning process uh, as you're working through books and workbooks, pre-recorded lectures and master classes. We help you and the help facilitate a group conversation. And it, it's just a magical experience to be able to help people with a clinical inclination to, to understand this stuff and, and how it might fit into their world and how it might fit into their world sooner than you might think there are legal psychedelic options and, People aren't really touching those. There's plenty of safety studies on, on a lot of these drugs, and some of them are actually prescribable and uh, or just legal over the counter. So there are options to get involved right now, and we want to help you do that. So navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists is our answer, and classes start in February. We even have European-friendly times. I think we're starting at like 7 p.m. London time and also 7 p.m. Eastern. So to learn more, go over to psychedeliceducationcenter.com or psychedelicstoday.teachable.com. You can 
learn more about our offering for clinicians. We'd love to have you. And we really think it's a, an amazing offering. I, I really wish I had this when I was in college. So hope you all have a great listen to this episode with Dr. Peter Addy, and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today, everybody. This is Joe Moore. Today on the show, we have Peter Addy. Thanks for joining us, Peter. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, Peter, you are a uh, formerly a research psychologist at Yale University. Now you are a therapist in private practice in Washington and Oregon. Mm. Yeah, so let's uh, maybe talk a little bit about you and your background. So I, I just found out that you helped found the Yale Psychedelic Speaker Series. That's amazing. Maybe you could tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Sure. So um, I was at Yale University for about six years, postdoc in research and uh, clinical work, and then uh, on as faculty. And one of the last things I did there was I, I co-founded the Yale Psychedelic Science Group, which is uh, ongoing today. They've been uh, doing that for, what, maybe three years now, I think. And I, I started, I just wanted to get a sense of who, who else at Yale School of Medicine is interested in psychedelics. And maybe we could just get together once in a while and talk about some of the latest journal articles that are coming out. Because there's so much now. There's been just this explosion of research. It's more than any one person can keep up with. And everyone has different areas of expertise. I'm not really a, a brain imaging guy. I used to work with people who are. So I would love to get different perspectives on, on the studies that are coming out. But it quickly evolved into more of a speaker series where we can um, invite people from uh, different research labs and talk about what they're doing and just really kind of the main goal was or is to normalize that psychedelic research is research that you can talk about it like anything else there's nothing taboo or weird or cultish about talking about lsd or mysticism or even um spiritual experiences that people have at ayahuasca retreats. These are all phenomena that you can put under a lens just like you would any other topic. And so really just trying to destigmatize it and just make it a normal topic of conversation. Yeah, that's huge. And I think that is, in a lot of ways, why people are organizing all over the world right now in similar veins, mm. you know, not necessarily at universities, but, you know, Harvard, just did, uh, I think, founded a group not that long ago. Actually, I think there's a psychiatry group at Harvard that's been doing talks for years, which is really neat. I, I kind of forgot oh, about them. Yeah. But these big institutions, Yale, Harvard, you know, I think Imperial, you know, it's great to see that this is happening. Did you see yeah. some movement in perspective at Yale um, after a little bit of time, or how did that shake I did. out? I mean, yeah, I uh, I wouldn't want to say that it was entirely because of me, but as you know, there were a number of pieces, a number of things that were moving around kind of behind the scenes. And so now there is psychedelic research happening at Yale. And I, I had been in my own little silo. I thought I was the only one and I was trying to get some MDMA research off the ground. So I was there just to back up a little. I joined a pharmacology lab in 2011 for my postdoctoral research on salvia. Uh, they were the team was studying mostly THC, mm -hmm. but they were also doing some work with ketamine, salvinorin A. Uh, what I've these things that I have come to refer to as atypical psychedelics because they're not your classic serotonin five uh, HT two A agonists, but they still can produce psychedelic and mystical effects with certain set and setting. So I was studying that and I wanted to bring in MDMA research or psilocybin research, but I was kind of the only one. It was me and, uh, and Andrew Sewell, who was uh, an amazing researcher. And he was, he was, uh, his big thing was cluster headaches. And he really wanted to study psilocybin uh, or LSD for cluster headaches. And he, he had some, a small grant that he had gotten from the, uh, from Cluster Busters, the Cluster Headache Society. And then unfortunately, he uh, died in 2012. And uh, that was a big hit for, for everyone at the team, but particularly for me, because he was my one ally in wanting to pursue psychedelic research at Yale. So I, th I thought I was alone and that this would never happen. And I was just uh, kind of knocking on doors and no one was interested. I was able to do, uh, I, I was able to drum up a little interest in some um, 
MDMA research with non-human primates for a particular pet study, but they never really... Uh, we did a little pilot work, but it never really went anywhere. And I'm not really that interested in animal research. I mean, I'm glad that it's being done. And when other people do it, like that's exciting. I think that animal research can be conducted ethically. It isn't always, but I'm not, um, uh, I'm not 100% against animal research. I think that you know, it should be limited and only under very certain circumstances. But it's not something that I personally am, am really interested in. And that's the only interest I was able to get. So then just kind of as a last ditch effort, I wanted to found this journal club just to see like, you know, find the others. Like, is there anyone else who's interested in that? And now through a number of things that were happening that I wasn't aware of, that I had no part in. And as partly due to the Yale Psychedelic Science Group, there's now both MDMA and psilocybin research happening. They're exploring I'm not even sure I know everything that's happening, but there's they're looking at psilocybin for cluster headaches, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and also Yale connecting with, she's not at UConn anymore, but whatever that, that group is called that's uh, doing an MDMA uh, trial with MAPS. And there very well might be other things that I don't even know about anymore. So there's been an explosion of research there. And I'm very excited to that I'm, I'm not, I'm doing it. I'm not there anymore, but it's happening at least partly because of, of some of my the groundwork that I helped lay. Yeah, absolutely. If you didn't do some of these basic things at the beginning, people probably would still feel like there was a taboo that they didn't want to touch. Mm, yeah. you know, the university world is tricky. Like Everybody is kind of, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are really working for tenure and career, which perhaps mm. they should be, but there's a lot of really sticky things that go along with that. Mm. So yeah, that's awesome. And, and back to this animal research thing, people people might question like why you don't think it's great, but I think the number one mm-hmm. reason, well, there's two. You know, there's some tricky ethics to it, um, and then secondly, they they can't tell you what they experienced. And human subjects with these fairly mm-hmm. safe drugs can tell you what they experienced. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a, I'm a psychologist, so my like all of my training has been in about experience. I did a lot of work, uh, the, the school that I went to at the time was called the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. They've since mm-hmm. rebranded their Sophia University now. But um, transpersonal psychology focuses a lot on qualitative research on the experience, the phenomenology that a person is having, and you can't ask that of a primate or a rodent. And that's been, always been my number one interest, is what happens. You're just sitting in a room, everything's normal, your mind in your own business, and then a flip of a switch. And then all of a sudden, there's uh, THC or salvinorin in your system, and everything is different. It's not just I'm in the world and things look more colorful, but the world itself is different. I'm seeing more colors than I used to think exist. I don't have a body anymore. And that kind of experience is just fascinating to me. And and you can't get that with animal research. So... (laughs) But what you can do, the argument to be made from the people who were interested in doing this this MDMA primate research was that we can see how MDMA works in the brain, where it sticks and where it doesn't, and how that affects things like oxytocin and vasopressin levels, and look at particularly, they were... I forgot now, but I think that they were... So Yale is uh, does a lot of really good stuff with PET, positron emission tomography. Yeah. Right? I yeah. think I said that right. Uh, they have all these really cool ligands that no one else has. And so you can look at, for instance, I believe the question was, how does MDMA affect different serotonin receptor subtypes? 1A versus 1B, 2A versus 2B, things like that. And so you can see what that looks like with a non-human primate just to kind of prove that there is a signal to the noise and that it's safe and that you can actually get the data and then do that in humans. But no one wanted to jump directly into into doing PET scans with humans, even though there's a huge safety literature with MDMA. There's uh, there's also a lot of people are, are really turned off because of ecstasy and molly and these things that do have harms especially cognitive and uh, structural harms to the brain associated with them. But ecstasy and MDMA are different things. I don't know how many times I've said that, but it's, um, 
it's hard to convince people. So the way that I was able to perhaps convince people was by starting with some non-human primate studies. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Maybe let's go even uh, a little further backwards. So I actually did apply to ITP years ago for the psych program, or I I actually forget because it was so long ago, but I really wanted to get a psych um, master's years ago. Mm. So I had all the paperwork and for whatever reason, didn't do it. Where, where was it or where is it? Uh, It's in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's the same building. So they're in, they're in Palo Alto. They've uh, expanded. I think they have two or three buildings now, but they just, uh, for various internal political reasons that we don't need to get into, they've rebranded, but uh, they were, and they've they've done it before. I mean, they, they uh, were founded in 1975 by Jim Fadiman, who I'm sure you know, and a lot of people know, and um, Robert Frazier. And that was the California Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. It used to be CITP. And then they, they moved and they dropped the California part to, because even, you know, amongst certain people, labeling something as California is kind of, there's a stigma there. Like, ah, oh, it's a little, it's a little out there. It's a little woo. <laughs> so uh, just dropping the word California gives you a little more respectability. So it's been ITP for many years. Uh, and that's where I went. There was a brief window where they were offering a PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, initially, there was, and while I was there, and for many years, like their whole thing was, you can get a degrees in transpersonal psychology, which is very cool. Not many people, not many places in the world, offer that. But again, to just make it a little look a little more respectable, and to have there is a slightly different emphasis between transpersonal and clinical psych, so they wanted to offer both. So I got that, and they've uh, uh, since, as part of that rebranding, I don't think they offer that anymore. They offer other many other degrees, but not that one. So I have a very rare find of a PhD in clinical psychology for my TP. Mm, very cool. <laughs> and was there a reason you were interested in transpersonal psych in general? Uh, did some you run into some books or have an experience or something? Mm. Yeah, it all started uh, freshman year of college. I found a dusty old book in the library, first edition, Altered States of Consciousness by Charles Tart. Mm. And that changed everything. Uh, That was, I don't remember when that was first published. I want to say 1970, give or take. And he wrote about well, altered states of consciousness. And there was only one, like one section of that book was about drug related ones, cannabis, and I think some others. But, you know, he talked about meditation. And he was one, this, this was one of the first books. I mean, meditation is a, probably a billion dollar industry now. Everyone's talking about mindfulness. There are a hundred apps out there. But that too, that used to be very marginalized. Meditation uh, was seen as these primitives from other cultures who were engaging in auto hypnosis and just kind of it's not useful and it, it is perhaps pathological to engage in that kind of a practice and he was so this book was one of the first places that really legitimized it or started to mm. and so that that was uh, that was a game changer for me and um i found out that charles tart teaches at the institute of transpersonal psychology along with another number of other people who were interested in psychedelics or just kind of uh, medicine related changes in consciousness. So I, I always find it interesting and tricky to talk about transpersonal psychology, but I think that's because I always get hung up on either like drugs or religion. Mm. And I, I was reading one of the, what is it called? Transpersonal psychology handbook. It's kind of like a 600 page manual or something on trans mm. and I opened it up and I found all this stuff about Kabbalah and like esoteric religion stuff and I, th- I found mm. that really interesting because mm. I, I spent a little bit of time in the western esoteric stuff and I had some really strange non-drug experiences and you know I've been doing breath work for ages so I've had plenty of breath work experience or non-drug so it's like okay this is clearly not the drug exclusively there's something about our human nature that allows this to happen. Mm-hmm. Have you ever kind of wrestled with that concept of like, what, what is this? I know there's minimal data to really back stuff, but you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I believe strongly that it, that psychedelic or transpersonal is an adjective. It's not a noun. It describes a particular state that one can have, and you can have a psychedelic experience by taking salvia or mushrooms or 
breath work or uh, meditation, sex, body, uh, you know, body modification rituals. I mean, there are tons of ways that you can have these transcendent states. Mm. And so it's, and you can take psychedelics, you can take mushrooms or salvia or something and not have a psychedelic experience. It's not a one-to-one correlation. So it's really about the, the experience that one is having the psychological thing. But transpersonal psychology is more than just that. So there's kind of three subcategories of the umbrella category of what transpersonal psychology is, which um, I refer to as transcendence, wholeness, and transformation. So in my private practice, I talk to people about those three things all the time. And we might never, I might never utter the word psychedelic, and we might not talk about drugs at all. But we're, we're always, always in the back of my mind and sometimes in the forefront of our conversation. I believe that everyone has an innate desire towards transcending who they are, towards moving towards wholeness and personal and societal transformation. You might have one of these peak, like a Maslow peak experience. And that could just be through walking through the woods on a beautiful day. You know, it doesn't have to be related to drugs, but you have an experience that transcends the normal day-to-day waking reality. And sometimes, under certain circumstances, that can help you to become more whole. And that's to say that we're not broken and in need of fixing. We're whole as we are, and we move towards greater levels of wholeness. And then sometimes... Through doing that, not only do we transform who we are, but we become more interested in and more able to transform the people around us. If I'm kind, then other people around me are are more likely to be kind. And you can have ripple effects. And so transpersonal psychology is about the transformation of groups and societies as much as it is about having a cool trip. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. Okay, so I didn't even expect to talk about transpersonal psychology as much, but <laughs> thank you for uh, helping us there. So anything before we jump into this amazing salvia topic? Uh, let's see. I've, uh, I, I've been noticing a lot on um, podcast talks that I give, things like that, that I talk a lot about clinical application and, and clinical research. And you know, given my background, of course, I mean, that's what I did. That's what I'm interested in. I can, I can critically read peer-reviewed articles and, and understand them and digest them in a way that any people in the general public probably can't. So I talk a lot about clinical work, but I don't for a second believe that that's the only way or the right way to use psychedelics. You know, Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is proven to do a lot of really good things, and it can reduce symptoms and help people in a lot of ways, but it's not the only way And it's not necessarily the right way. Um, I don't think there is any one right way to use psychedelics. There are wrong ways. You know, don't take a psychedelic and drive. You know, very, very simple. Um, Now, there are definitely wrong ways to do it, but no one culture owns this experience. That's whether that's the culture of Western materialistic science or an indigenous culture, that these are tools that are constantly being adapted for new, by new people for new things. And uh, so some, so I, I've just, I've been noticing a lot that a lot of my public persona has been talking about um, science, perhaps reductionistic science. And that's a wonderful way to understand them, but it's not the only way. And so I, I'm, I'm working a little more now to, to maybe be more holistic in my own approach and in my own discussion that if people want to, have a recreational experience, you know, like that can sometimes be looked down on like, Oh, you're just gonna, you're just gonna take acid and go to a fish show. That's not spiritual. You can look down your nose at that, but there's, that's fine. I mean, there's risks involved. I don't want to say that, that that's a healthy thing and I'm not encouraging anyone to do anything that would be illegal because that's the main risk. Of course, of any of these experiences is that they're outside the law and going to prison is never good for your mental health. <laughs> no, you uh, can even pick that, up actual diseases there too. Um, yeah. So it's not, not ideal. 
But yeah, yeah but I mean, I'm on that board. being said, <laughs> if you're within certain paradigms of risk management, if you want to go, you know, it's not like recreational use is bad and clinical use is good. And certainly only doing, only exploring these things within the concept of a DSM diagnosis is extremely limiting. So there, there are, uh, I guess my point is that there are a lot of different ways to approach these states and these substances and there's no, and, and I don't want to come off as saying that the scientific paradigm or the clinical research paradigm is like the apex is the best of the best. It's one of many. Right. I think when we talk like this, people get confused, right? Because the culture says like, science is the only thing and medicine is the only mm. thing in a lot of ways. It, it's like a mm. exclusionary in a lot of ways. So people get a little confused when we talk about this, but I, I think having a healthy critique of, yeah, here we go. <laughs> this is opening me up to some attacks, but a healthy critique of science and the scientific method in the modern world is helpful because it's super reductionistic and partialistic. Mm. Like science mm. really is a series of provisional truths, right? Like, Yes, with these instruments, you get these results. But who's to say those instruments are like abutting something that looks like objective truth? And, it, and mm. you know, when we look at transpersonal psychology, it's really holistic. And, mm. um, you know, when we look at holotropic breathwork, it's really holistic. It's bringing it down to one measure, like a depression score, mm. is, is like kind of besides the point in a lot of ways. Like, is your whole life better? But how do you even measure that? Like, I don't, Yeah. I, there's approaches, like people <laughs> try, but I don't, I don't know. So I, I like to say like, hey, challenge your assumptions about science. Science is kind of the best tool we have for getting closer and closer to, you know, quote unquote, objective reality, but that's not necessarily a real thing anyway. So mm. how... <laughs> It's, you know, I, did I miss anything there on my critique? I, you did a really great job. I just kind of wanted to add a couple other things just in case people were confused. Yeah, I think, I think that's really good. That science is a tool. It's a fantastic tool. It can do things that no other tool can do, but uh, it's not the only tool. And it's not always the correct tool. Art is an amazing tool as well. You can... I've read plenty and people have, people come up to me at conferences and email me all the time and give me their salvia trip reports. And like, that's, that's interesting, but it's verbal language and that's limiting. So I've seen, on the other hand, I've seen some images, no words associated with it other than here's an image about my salvia trip that I think conveys it way better than a thousand words or 10,000 words. And so art is an amazing tool. Um, there's a lot of literature and kind of the, the humanities are equal to the sciences for exploring these things. Or as you mentioned, you know, things like Kapala and mysticism. I mean, this is how we learn about our world and our minds. And there's, you know, science is a good tool, but it's not the only one. Are you familiar with uh, Tom Roberts? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, fascinating guy. I, I like his approach where <laughs> he suggests that because of psychedelics and access to many different kinds of transpersonal states, all these new field or all the existing fields from scholastic academic work to research to even martial arts could be heavily informed and potentially infor improved by adding psychedelics and various transpersonal states to the research repertoire. Um, his new book, Mind Apps, looks really exciting. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I think he gets into this idea a little bit more in there. Yeah, I haven't read it yet either, but it's, um, but yeah, that, that seems to be the gist of it from what I understand. Um, and it, you know, I mentioned ITP ha was founded by two people. Jim Fadiman did psychedelic research back in the day in the 60s. And then Bob Frazier is one of the highest ranking Aikidoists in the world. Mm. And every every first year student is required to take Aikido. And then I, uh, every second year student has to take uh, one body art. And I, I chose to, to do a second year of Aikido. And that's, if you don't know, that's a nonviolent martial art from Japan. And it, uh, it works really well as a, a, an adjunct to therapy. It took me like six or nine months to figure it out. I'm like, why are we doing this? This makes no sense. But 
yeah, it's subtle, but it's it's a, it, it, there's some really good para, uh, parallel processes there. And so martial arts can be a very psychedelic, mind-expanding kind of practice. And not only for yourself, but as you interact with other people, it's kind of, uh, he used to say all the time that it's like, it's the couple's meditation. There's two people involved. And if you're not being mindful, you're going to get smacked in the face. And then he, he, you are mindful. Um, so <laughs> no, to be clear, no one was taking any drugs during any of these Aikido sessions, at least not that I'm aware of. But again, psychedelic, it doesn't have to be related to drugs. The An interesting phenomena that you're probably aware of is that the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world for some reason has really picked up psychedelics. Um, I think I've Joe seen a Rogan little that. I don't know, it. I don't know much. Uh, it's, we've done a few I've podcasts a little, on it. I've seen a little there and uh, in the world of extreme sports. I'm told that Olympic halfpipe snowboarders are, are regularly using LSD during practice mm. and competition, um, which is super interesting to me. Mm. I, that to me, if, if that's true, I haven't talked to these people directly, but if that's true, people at this high level of performance are doing that, that really should interest sports psychologists and open up that area of research a little bit. I don't know what to do and how to approach that given the legal status, but it, it's a fascinating thing. I, for whatever reason, I still haven't skied or snowboarded on LSD. Um, <laughs> if and when I'm healthy, healthy and brave enough, maybe, but... Uh, it's just fascinating that these people are willing to go 20 feet in the air on acid and hit ice at high speeds and apparently win medals. Um, so who knows? <laughs> um, okay, so let's jump into salvia because um, this Ooh. is super interesting. Um, as you said, an atypical psychedelic, um, salvinorin A allegedly is the active molecule. Um, has there been research to kind of give it, uh, this is the molecule, it's not all sorts of other stuff in the plant? Not really. I mean, we definitely, we can say very clearly in rodents, primates, and humans that salvin RNA produces these kinds of profound effects. Okay. But there are, oh, I don't remember now, there are at least a dozen, maybe maybe more like 20 unique compounds in the salvia divinorum leaf. There's salvinorins, divinorins, and salvinicins, and they all have letters after them. So there, there are um, many, and None of the other ones have been examined in humans, and I don't think in primates. Maybe a little bit of rodent research on like salvinorin B or C, but it's kind of like cannabis. You know, cannabis is more than THC, but we don't know what any of these other things do. And it would just be you could test each one individually and you could test different combinations of things, but that would just be a very expensive, lengthy process even in something more simple like rodent models so it just hasn't been done as far as i know so salvin rna definitely does stuff and it's the most common ingredient by weight so of these okay. unique compounds so uh that's the the obvious one to look at and experientially like based on what you've seen and read people seem to have similar reports yeah, so in my doctoral research, I um, people used a concentrated standardized extract where they were using salvinorin A that was added to salvia divinorum leaf. So they had some of those other compounds, but not not in the the same quantities, the same ratios. And then at Yale and um, you know Hopkins and the other research groups, they're using just purified salvinorin A. But as far as just, you know, reports that I get from Arrowhead or Drugs Forum or, you know, any of these people that, that have told me their stories over the years, it seems pretty close, if not the same as the experience you have under, under pure Salvin RNA. Cool. And so how did you get interested in researching Salvia? Was it just not populated with much research? That was part of it. It was um, at ITP. It was time for me to pick a dissertation topic. And I had a few ideas, but, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then I read a, a news article that the California State Assembly was considering a bill to outlaw salvia. And so and within California, salvia would be a Schedule One controlled substance. 
And so I thought to myself, um, if I don't do this research right now, pretty soon no one will be able to do this research. If it's illegal in California, it'll be illegal in more and more states. There was a federal push in 2006. And you know, one of the, any day now, salvia will be federally outlawed. And then no one's going to be able to do this. I mean, obviously, you can do research and schedule one substances, but it's a lot harder. Um, and you have to be a lot more motivated. But right now, if there's no state rules, I could just do a, something. You know, I, I, can't, I can't do a lot. I don't have the material or the, the money or anything, but I could do something now while, while I still can. Um, so that, that's, that's what pushed me to study salvia. It also pushed me to do my, dip my toes into the water for the first time of political activism. I wrote the author of that bill and I wrote every member of the committee who was considering it. And so did Daniel Siebert. And so did, um, uh, the Arrowwood organization. And, um, and we were able to convince them to not do that. So the bill was not voted on. The author then uh, went back and he rewrote it to make salvia the illegal for minors. So, and that did pass. So in California now, if you're 18 or over, you can possess, buy, sell salvia. But if you're a child, a teenager, then you can't. And I, I disagree with that for a few reasons, but it's... Um, but that was my first taste that like, you know, just writing letters, you know, I didn't speak to anyone like in any committees or anything, but just by kind of making my voice heard, I and other people were able to change this committee's mind. Mm. And that was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, that's very helpful. And what year was this? Oh, let's see, maybe 08 or 09. That seems about right. That's kind of peak yeah. salvia for the States. Mm. Yeah right around the time YouTube was getting very popular and Salvia on YouTube yeah. was very popular. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Cool. So how did you approach your research? Did you do like field study first and some case reports or, or what, what were you going after there? No, I, I jumped right into it. I wanted to uh, study the experience. And at this point, so the, the landscape in 2008 was there were two studies of salvia use in humans. Mm. Daniel Siebert's groundbreaking work in, published in 94 or 96, uh, first ever, where he gave salvia to human beings and recorded. And this was, he looked at both salvia and salvinorin A, which mm. was really cool, and a few different routes of administration. And so this proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that salvinorin A has psychoactive effects. No one knew why back then. We didn't know. We knew it didn't affect serotonin, probably, but we didn't know what it did. And then in 2002, there was uh, an Italian team that just looked at some pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. What does this look like in urine samples? They didn't really do anything about the subjective effects or or anything. It was pretty basic work. And the the main finding in that study was that people on salvia don't like getting their blood drawn. Uh, more than one person refused that. <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. Like people typically, I don't, I don't know if it's a hundred percent of the time, if you get the appropriate dose, you're essentially dissociated and, yeah. you know, any kind of intervention I, I could see not liking being touched and plenty of other things, mm. especially jabbed with a needle, you know? Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that, that was the landscape at the time. And I knew that Johns Hopkins was doing something, but I didn't really know a lot about, what they're really and quiet so was, about their salvia stuff still <laughs> yeah 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 um so i thought you know it's up to me so i i uh recruited 30 healthy people who had all used psychedelics about a third of them had used salvia before and i um i used carefully controlled set and setting and intention where they uh each person Used salvia. They either had this concentrated extract or just unadulterated plano salvia leaf in such a small amount that you might call that a microdose or not even that much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, man, what was what was that? Twenty five milligrams. Whereas a, uh, a a full on psychedelic dose of unadulterated salvia leaf, you might need a gram. So twenty five milligrams. A gram is tough. 
Yeah, it is. Um, that's just a lot of material you have to go through. So, but, um, so that's why a lot of people use extracts. And this is more um, ecologically valid, more generalizable to use the parlance because no one, no one in the, in the real world is using salvinorin A. You just, you just don't have access to that. You don't have access to microgram scales very often. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so most people are using the leaf or extracts of the leaf. So that's what I wanted to do. Mm. And so each person either smoked one or the other and counterbalanced uh, double blind conditions. And I did a very good job, I think. I worked very hard to create a relaxing set and setting. There was uh, low lighting. You're, you got to sit in a recliner and put your feet up. I did some classical music playing in the background. I led everyone through a body relaxation script. And we did a, a brief uh, just kind of mindfulness exercise. And then they smoked it themselves. And that was, for whatever reason, that was a key point with my institutional review board. I'm not the one using the lighter and like making them smoke. They're doing it. I'm just giving it to them. And then uh, they just had an experience and then maybe 10 minutes later they came back and we talked about it and i had some standardized questions that i asked everyone which was basically what did you see what did you hear what did you smell what did you taste what did you touch what did you feel emotionally like just kind of running through some of those systems and i just wanted to record what what was going on what happened and i did a few quantitative measures but most of it was qualitative and so that was Man, that was 08 through 2010, mm. probably. And then um, published my dissertation. And then from that, two articles. So you can read the, re- the quantitative paper came out in 2012. And then the qualitative paper a few years after that. That's great. So typically, people are able to sit still, kind of. Um, did you have people kind of get up and get a little agitated in the room? Or try to escape. Not agitated, but I, I'd say I definitely reported this because that's such that's such a common thing that you see in YouTube. But so I, I definitely have the numbers, but not in my head right now. But I want to say two people. I want to say two people got up, like stood up and moved in any way. The other everyone else just kind of laid there. I mean, if you were just an observer looking in, you'd be like, oh, someone's napping on a chair, and then someone else is sitting there with a little notepad. Mm-hmm. And and the first person is maybe talking in their sleep a little bit once in a while. Uh, two people stood up. One of them wanted to get a, a closer look at one of the paintings on the walls, and the other person, I don't remember, but they they just stood up and then sat down again. It was fine. Um, cool. So you you see all these scary things on YouTube, people walking into the glass tables and all this stuff. And I'm sure part of that is the set and setting again. You know, I wanted to really help people feel comfortable to just lay there in a chair for 20 minutes. So, yeah, that's great. I think a lesson here is that even with atypical psychedelics, the standard rules seem to persist. Um, Hmm. Yeah. Um, Were you in the ITP building or did you have a different lab you went to? Uh, It was, it was in there. This was the, um, this uh, I borrowed the room from the William James Center for Consciousness Research. And William James is one of my favorite psychologists ever, probably one of the, the greatest American psychologists, also very inspirational to me. Um, and that lab was founded by Arthur Hastings, who did a lot of altered states, non-drug altered states research. Um, so, so he had a good setup. He had a good room already for his own, uh, his own projects. And so I was able to borrow that and uh, just kind of, it was uh, in the back of the building. So there wasn't a lot of loud noise. I tried to schedule the stuff in the evenings or weekends when there weren't a lot of people around. That's great. And, uh, to, and to mention, it wasn't just me and them. Uh, another part of the review board is that I needed to have a nurse. So I just um, put all this on my credit card and I paid, I found uh, two, one nurse and then one uh, EMT who were able to just work for minimum wage to just kind of sit there in the next room just in case. And there was no just in case. Nothing ever happened. But, but still, if nothing else, that's nice for the psychological mindset to know like if I do have some kind of medical problem, there's a professional with a kit in the next room. It's not needed, but that, that can kind of take the edge off a little bit, I think. 
Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. I've I've had that actually cut both ways. Some people say, Ooh. "Why do I why do I need a nurse? I thought this was really safe." It's like, well, yeah, but <laughs> but it's it's interesting, right? There's some subtlety there. I don't think we have enough research to really know how to totally navigate that, but I, I think we're getting closer, mm-hmm. especially you know in the last decade. Yeah. Well, one of my one of my all time favorite scientific experiments is from I want to say the '60s, early '60s. They were doing some. Um, kind of sensory deprivation adjacent research because we think about like float tanks, but there are other other paradigms for sensory deprivation. And so it's my my favorite study. I, I got it somewhere. I could we could link to it later if I can find it. But they just um so a team would have someone sit in a room and it's just a room. You know, they're just sitting in a chair. There's nothing to do and uh nothing to look at. And they're just kind of sitting there by themselves. And then after whatever the time frame was, uh, the RA would come in and just ask them some questions, whatever, you know, just kind of boring, not great, not bad. Half of the time, half of the condition, there was a tray, there was a little table with a little tray in the room. And the, the tray had some syringes that were labeled for uh, emergency use only. <laughs> No one, no one mentioned it. No one said like, "Hey, you might have a bad time." No one said. No one even pointed it out. It was just there in the corner. Mm. And if you're just sitting in a room with nothing to do for I don't know a half an hour, you're gonna notice it. You're gonna look at it. And so when the the people, the researchers came in afterwards and asked the the subjects about their experience, there was a lot more anxiety. It was very uh, uncomfortable, and a lot more stuff came up from just sitting in a room because it had that tray in the corner. <laughs> That's fascinating. Wow. All right. So back to your study, what do, do you have kind of like a, anything you like to pitch about your results? Like what? Do you, uh, I don't even know yeah. I mean, a lot that. of, a lot of interesting stuff came up and I've talked about it. Um, you know, I've there, I have a few YouTube videos where I go over a lot of the results in detail, but the kind of the sticking point, the main thing that I took away from it was how, what an interesting thing salvia does to a person's relationship with their body. It really got me interested in somatic work and um, embodiment and in more in mind-body practices. I, might, I had already been, do, been practicing Aikido and yoga, but it got me just really more interested in that side of things because of how salvia affects your body. And sometimes it turns your body into other things. You might be a zipper or you might be the leg of a chair, not even the whole chair, just a leg of a chair. And so sometimes your body just radically alters into something else. And then other times your body is still there, but it's quite different that um, maybe uh, let's see, someone could feel their heart beating, but it was in their knees instead of their chest. Um, and they felt that the spirit of salvia, because there's a personification of this plant, usually as the woman, and that the, the salvia spirit reached in and rearranged this person's organs. Or uh, you can kind of feel this unzippering in your body as well as seeing it in the room around you. And so just the way that people's bodies change, totally unique. Uh, you get things that you just are not reported with serotonin serotonergic psychedelics right yeah we we talk about it like dimensionality and and somatic um stuff Mm -hmm. i i do find that really interesting and that is like very apparent in the literature right like squishing Mm -hmm. and stretching are like the two the basics but then yeah Mm -hmm. identification with things is really interesting Mm -hmm. that uh, what's the term for like um like in the body sensation, it's not proprioception because that's more like how your body is in space, but it's like an internal proprioception. Yeah. Interoception. Interoception. Okay. Which I is a word that I, I never knew that concept. I came about, I learned about that in trying to figure out what was going on with salvia. I learned about interoception and how the interoception sense is sometimes connected with um, different kinds of treatment for mm. depression, drug abuse, and things like that. So it's under there is a clinical understanding of how people's in- sense of interoception can change over time and how one person's can be different from another's. But as far as I know, that's never really strictly been 
plugged into the psychedelic world outside of my own uh, interests. Right. There's not too much like that would that would actually be a great line of interest that pe- <laughs> researchers could just go at. That in and of itself could be a career. I think um, <laughs> if you had the right funding. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Are, are you planning to do any research in the future around salvia or anything else related to psychedelics or are you still? Maybe I have some, I have some feelers out. I have some kind of irons in the fire. I think the phrase is, but um, you know, none of that might come to fruition or several things might come to fruition. So, you know, if, if something happens later, I'll tell you about it, but it's uh, partly I'm, you know, I really like, there are things that I really like about the research world and that kind of uh, lifestyle. And there are things that I don't like about it or that didn't agree well with me. I think you have to have a certain kind of personality to be working as a full-time academic researcher. And I don't have the body or the personality for that. So, which is why I'm doing clinical work now, because I think that's a much better fit for who I am and what I'm interested in and the ways that I enjoy interacting with people. But I do like research and I have a ton of experience. I'd like to think I'm pretty good at it. So, um, you know, I have some, I have some ideas. I'm definitely interested in, uh, in helping more psychedelic research happen in new and interesting spheres. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's plenty of, perhaps a big lesson here from what you've done is taken an unscheduled drug before some sort of criminality got put on it and mm. you were able to execute on a whole bunch of research. I, mm. I'm i actually quite surprised at the lack of salvia research because it's so mm. interesting. It's federally unscheduled. Yes, it's illegal in Colorado and a number of other places, but you know, there's plenty of research left to do on this thing and it's relatively mm. safe and quite available. Um, yeah. And I think you set the precedent that it's fine to do research on this. Plenty of a couple other folks as well. Yeah. I think one of, you know, there are many reasons why, but I think one, one kind of barrier to further exploration is that it's, um, it's pretty weird. You know, it's uh, a lot of my participants are like, man, that was just a bizarre thing. I don't even know what happened. And, Part of that, I think, is the you know the pharmacokinetics of the chemical. But part of that, I think, is the route of administration. Anytime you smoke something, it's going to hit you quickly, and it's going to be over quickly. And so a salvia trip might last 10 minutes. And by the time you figure out what the hell is going on, it's over. And there are a few books out there where people have been able to use smoked salvia and, and be able to navigate that space over time. But I think for the most part, it's just so weird that you don't know what to do with it. And so uh, traditionally, the Mazatec people, they don't smoke it. They consider that a sacrilege. You're setting the goddess on fire. That's a really mean thing to do. So the the, um, sublingual methods that they use, it comes on slower and it lasts longer. And longer is still maybe just three hours. It's shorter than a, a mushroom experience, but long enough and slowly and subtly enough that you can do some work in that space. So if people, people ask me all the time, like, what are the clinical applications or what is the, what's the potential for, for healing or personal growth or whatnot from salvia? And the main thing I could say is I don't think smoking it is the way to go. It seems uh, some people are able to work with that, but most people I think aren't. Have you seen the, um, you're familiar with Hamilton Morris? Yeah. Um, he did a really interesting TV episode uh, where he actually went and did work with some Mazatec folks um, using the sublingual method. And it, I think it misfired the first time. It didn't really go for him. But the second mm-hmm. time, he's on the floor just rolling around saying, love, love, love over mm-hmm. again. And you wouldn't know it was different from ayahuasca just from looking at it, which is mm-hmm. really, um, you know, and he's a hardcore skeptic allegedly, um, (laughs) or at least the media persona is. And it's a really interesting look at, you know, what can happen to somebody on this particular drug. And the fact that there's religious use makes me think there could be clinical applications, but I, I tend to think you're right. Like just given transpersonal or depth psychology, we need 
a longer period of time to be working on this material if that, if that's how we're working on things. I, mm. I guess that would be one theory of operation theory, <laughs> but I'm sure there's a hundred others that we want to work with. And, you know, I'm sure people would say because we're not working on certain receptor sites, therefore it's not anywhere similar, but I, you know, as we see breath work and ayahuasca can look very similar. So, you know, why, <laughs> what is the real difference? Mm. And I suppose any, any words of advice for younger folks trying to get into the field? Mm. Yeah, I think that one thing that I learned if so, you know, getting into the field, that's very broad. Like, what does the field even mean? If we mean <laughs> yeah. the field of right. like um, of academic research, then, you know, within that field, I think it's really important to have other interests for several reasons. One is that there isn't, a, it's not easy to get funding for this stuff. But even if you could, even if there's like an amazing source of funding that you can get. Uh, for any kind of psychedelic research you want, for the most part, you want to attach it to something else. I think one of the brilliant things that MAPS did is they, they, weren't, they weren't coming across as saying, we want to study how MDMA is useful. I mean, of course, that's what they wanted to do. But the way that they're selling that is, we want is PTSD is terrible, and we don't have a lot of good treatment for it here's something that might be a unique way to help with that. And it just so happens that it's this really interesting psychedelic drug. The same way with most of the psilocybin research and, uh, and everything else, that if you're interested in depression or OCD or cluster headaches, that's the interest. That's the thing that you're focusing on and that you can apply psychedelics to it because it's just a tool. It's just a tool like any other tool that can be researched. There's nothing weird about it. And that's, that's kind of the way that it's uh, expected to go, at least in my experience uh, and the experience of, of other people in academia that I'm aware of, that you want to have other, other things that you're interested in that you can tie psychedelics to. Um, and also if like, so, you know, I'm known as like the salvia guy, I'm the salvia expert and I, I have publications and some other stuff, but the bulk of it is on salvia. And that's good because I'm seen as the expert. But that can also kind of go against me that if I'm, uh, if I wanted to, I don't know, do, do a research study on interoception that had nothing to do with drugs, but I just wanted to study how people's bodies, how, the, how their, their feeling of their bodies changes over the course of the treatment, right? Uh, people would say, might say, oh, well, he's, you know, he's not an interoception guy. He's not a, a, a depression guy. He's the salvia guy. And so you can, you can kind of uh, put yourself into too much of a niche. So having other interests helps uh, against that. Right. Yeah, that's huge. I think in Hollywood terms, it's typecasting, right? Like you just get that's stuck. Right, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, how do I get out of this? Like, Got to do some cheap horror movies first. And well, you know, I think, you know, just to show that problem solving can happen and you can get out of it for people that want to do research, like you find the interioception people and you try to just partner on a project. And, you know, mm. academic research is alive and well. It's really well funded. There's plenty of projects to do. So, you know, if that's what you want to do, there's, there's avenues. Yeah. And so, and collaboration is, is really key to that so there's no uh you know we we see like oh uh, we get these big names like you know roland griffith he's he does this amazing work but he's part of an amazing team um you know anything that's going on at yale it's it's a really a team effort and some of those pieces they're operating behind the scenes and we don't even know about it but it's there you have to collaborate between different groups so like one of the last things that i that i did in academia is i worked with um with jordi riva's group in spain and they were doing salvia research. Um, the PI there, Ana Makeda, and I had traveled to Mexico and we knew each other. And so she was doing some salvia work. And I said, hey, ooh, um, how about interoception? Can you, can you check that out? And so they did. Um, and so we were able to collaborate on that piece together. And we found that, uh, let's see, low doses of salvia increase some measures of interoception. You're more trusting of your body high doses of salvia decrease in tear reception that you are less trusting 
of your body and you're less aware of and less able to make sense of your body, which I mean, obviously, but it's good to be able to, to show that in a statistical way and to say it affects interoception in this way, but not that way. And that ties into the broader literature. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. All right. Um, we're coming up on an hour, so maybe we can let people know what your what your website is and how they can get in touch with you if they want to work with you in the future. Um, so yeah, what's what's your website? Yeah, so uh, my website is peterhaddy.com. Uh, if you go on PubMed, there are other Peter Addies in the world. So I have to, so I'm distinguishing myself with my middle initial. So you can go to peterhaddy.com. You can uh, email or, or contact me, and I try to link all of my uh, papers and talks and stuff on there for people who don't have, uh, who can't get behind the paywall. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. And you're, you work with clients remotely over the internet too, not just in person. Right. I have an office in, in Vancouver, Washington, and I can, and I do a lot of, uh, online video psychotherapy, which is really, really cool medium. I really like being able to see people where they're at anywhere in the, the States or internationally. Yeah. And so uh, just to kind of wrap up, I think so a lot of people come up to me and they'll say, again, like, what are the clinical implications? They're like, how could I work with this? And it seems... So again, I'm not specifically giving advice, especially if you're in a state where it's illegal. Uh, I'm not recommending anyone break any laws. But if you're able to and, and you wanted to explore this, I, I would probably not start with smoking. And set and setting are all the more important. It's always important for for any kind of exploration, but it's especially important here uh, in Mexico. They say that the the salvia spirit is timid, like a deer, and bright lights and loud noises scare her away. And so you have it has to be dark, it has to be quiet, and the chanting is essential. I it's kind of the way that the experience is brought up is that you are participating in the ceremony and chanting along with the Corandera. So you're not just passively sitting there and the salvia thing happens. You're working it. You're doing it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. There's plenty of states where this is legal, everybody. So, um, you know, be safe. <laughs> people, people have, you know, been a little roughed up by this substance and you can play your cards right if you... <laughs> if you're just careful. So please play nicely. <laughs> Don't get hurt with this stuff. And um, if you're going to do research, share your data. It's really interesting stuff. And I, we're always up for hearing amateur research over here, citizen science. So anything you've got, we're well, probably interested in. So Peter Addy, thank you very much for joining us on Psychedelics today. I hope uh, we get you on again in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. And there you have it, Dr. Peter Addy, if you liked this episode, if you found it helpful, please, please, please tell a friend or leave us a review in your podcasting app or on Facebook, facebook.com slash psychedelics today. And you can leave us a review or maybe join our group. We've got a really cool group growing. It's, uh, I think we're at almost 3000 people in there. Really um, polite, awesome group, minimal spam. I delete everything that looks illegal or dangerous or anything like that. So it shouldn't clog up your space in Facebook. And yeah, we just really appreciate it when you tell your friends about us. So please do share your favorite episodes with some friends. And uh, I think, yeah, no real commentary there on the episode. It was a really fun time for me to talk with Peter Addy. I hadn't met him before and it was just, um, it was really nice to see his approach and perspective so I hope you all like that. I know I made some comments about science in there. Please take them as a philosophical critique, not a critique of science itself. Uh, meaning like I, I value science quite a bit. I think we need to evolve science. That's about it. Like uh, beyond triple blind, you know, placebo controlled studies. I don't know what, <laughs> what the move is, but I, I think we can do better than we're doing right now is essentially my point. I, think it's just going to take a, um, a serious effort to, to come up with something. 
yeah, so I think that's it uh, about the episode. Again, we've got Navigating Psychedelics coming up in February for clinicians and therapists. It's a live supported course with tons of pre recorded content, and it is the foundation you want for your psychedelic career. So please check it out at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. We've got testimonials up there. You can also see a little bit of what our curriculum looks like. And I think you'll like it. If you are a clinician, this is the class for you. So please come over to psychedeliceducationcenter.com to check it out. And we are also sponsored by Audible. So if you want a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial to Audible, Go to audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today or to psychedelicstoday.com slash welcome for more information on that. Plenty of books up there. The Michael Pollan, uh, How to Change Your Mind book is up there and plenty of other psychedelic classics from the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide to a couple Stan Groff books and more. So again, audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today. And we're also brought to you by Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com. Use the code PSY today, P-S-Y today, to get 10% off your order of everything except for fitness equipment. So drinks, supplements, food, et cetera. Some really great paleo items up there and mushroom infused products. Plenty of good stuff. So check that out. I, I just really like them as a company. I've been buying their stuff since probably 2004, 2003 or so. Great, great stuff. And I hope you check it out. So I think that's it for now. Again, if you, if you want uh, to perhaps leave us a small monthly donation, we would love it at patreon.com slash psychedelics today. All right, that's it <laughs> for, for real this time. Thank you all for tuning in to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore signing off. I hope you all have a great new year. See you on the next episode. Bye.